This is chapter 8 in your Essentials of Radiographic Physics and Imaging. Uh, this is on image production and evaluation, and it begins on page 84. All right, so, so far we have um, created the x-rays. We've made it out of the tube. We've talked about the interactions that take place within the patient, and now we are moving on to actually producing the radiographic image. And when we start uh, talking about the radiographic image, realize that you have to have some photons pass through the tissue and actually interact with the IR or the image receptor. And the amount and the quality of that primary beam will absolutely affect its interaction within the body's tissue. Not only how many photons, but the energy of the those photons determine if it's going to pass through, if it's going to be absorbed, or if it's going to scatter. And then along with that, the composition of the part that you're passing through will affect how the x-ray beam interacts as well. Um, is what you're passing through radiopaque, radiolucent, is it dense and really compact, or is it more loosely constructed? And then finally, the that exits the patient is made up of varying energies and it actually interacts with the image receptor to form the latent or invisible image. Now the latent image is the unseen image after exposure but prior to processing. So for example if you had film and you took the exposure when you were taking that into the dark room to develop it, there would be an image on that piece of film. You just couldn't see it at that point until you ran it through the chemistry of the developer and the fixer in order to visualize it. Kind of like with old time camera film, when you would end up with the roll of film and you would take it out of your camera and bring it to Walmart or Walgreens or wherever, you would have 24, 36, 12 exposures on that roll of film, but until they ran it through chemistry and processed those images, you couldn't see them. So all of those are latent images, meaning it's invisible, but it's after it's been exposed prior to being processed. The first thing they start off talking about is the differential absorption that takes place. And differential absorption tells us that different anatomy doesn't absorb the primary beam to the same degree. Um, so by this process of differential absorption, you get an image that will structurally represent the anatomic area that you pass through, meaning that more radiopaque objects like bone or contrast media tend to absorb the photons and more radiolucent areas tend to allow the photons to pass through unaffected. And, and because of that, where you get absorption, that would give you, remember, the white or the light clear areas on your image receptor. And where it passes through unaffected would give you the darker shades. And it's a combination of those darker shades that actually creates the, the x-ray image that we visualize. They also talk about beam attenuation. And attenuation um, is where there's a reduction either in quantity or energy of the photon as it passes through matter. So when there's a reduction in the energy, you're actually talking about Compton scatter because Compton scatter comes in with a certain amount of energy, interacts with the part and gives up some of its energy and continues on in a different direction with less energy. So that reduces the energy of the beam. And a reduction in the quantity or the number of photons would be photoelectric absorption, because once that photon gets absorbed, it no longer exists, which would reduce the overall number of photons. So attenuation is the reduction in energy or quantity of photons as the primary beam passes through matter. Okay, and this is a result of the photon interacting with the different structures in the anatomy that we're imaging and makes up the tissue. And typically those two processes are photoelectric absorption and Compton scattering. Because remember that photon can only do three things. It can pass through unaffected, which is transmission. It can be photoelectrically absorbed or it can undergo Compton scatter.
So when it says absorption on here, technically that's photoelectric absorption. And when it says scattering, technically that is Compton scattering. Now, photoelectric absorption, remember that is when the incident photon comes in, interacts with an inner shell electron of the body atom. It has to have energy equal to or greater than that binding energy of that inner shell. And when it knocks out that inner shell, that entire photon gets completely absorbed and ceases to exist. What it does, though, is create that void in the inner shell so that the electrons will then fill that void in a characteristic cascade. And each time that that electron jumps a shell level to fill a void, it releases what we call secondary energy or secondary radiation. Okay, so photoelectric absorption does ionize the body atoms and also allows the creation of secondary photons. So not only do we radiate the patient with a primary photon, but the body responds by creating secondary photons or um, secondary radiation within the patient as well. Now realize that those secondary um, photons that are created are typically of low energy, but still radiation nonetheless. And they're typically absorbed in the body within about one to two millimeters of where they take place. So wherever you have photoelectric absorption, like in the bone or in barium or in the iodine contrast media that we use, you also have secondary radiation being created. And remember, when you're talking about bone, that's calcium, which is atomic number 20, Barium is atomic number 53. I'm sorry, barium is atomic number 56. Iodine is atomic number 53. So when you start talking about using contrast media for this to take place, you're talking about much higher secondary radiation being created in the patient. The other interaction um, that takes place to cause attenuation is Compton scattering. And this is where the incident photon from the primary beam comes in tends to eject an outer shell electron. So it ionizes as well. That's why we use ionizing radiation. And that photon gives up some of its energy to knock that electron out. And then that photon continues on with less energy in a different direction. Okay, so it's an all direction. And remember, this is not beneficial to us at all. This um, can either cause um, occupational exposure to anyone in the room, typically us or the radiologist, or if the scatter is directed towards the image receptor, it actually causes radiation fog on our IR. And it, it takes, <clears throat> takes away from the clarity of the image. It obscures anatomy. <clears throat> Some of the differences between photoelectric and Compton, typically with photoelectric, the photon has to have high enough energy to knock out an inner shell electron, and then it gets completely absorbed. The electrons rush to fill the vacancy, which then creates a secondary photon in the patient. Okay. Um, you tend to have less photoelectric interactions when the energy of the KVP gets higher you tend to have less photoelectric with high KVP, more transmission, and more Compton scatter at high KVP. With low KVP, you tend to have more absorption, less transmission, less Compton scatter. With Compton, the photon loses some of its energy when it ejects an outer shell electron and there's a change in direction. And then that scattered photon can either be absorbed in the patient it can leave the part and interact with the image receptor, or it has the potential to cause occupational exposure. Okay, And any scatter that strikes your image receptor does nothing beneficial at all. It only takes away from your image. When we talk about Compton scattered photons, again, they contribute no useful information. They will never image anatomy. They add to the radiation dose of the patient and potentially others in the room. 
and it contributes to what we call radiation fog on our image. Transmission. Now this, um, this is the third thing that that photon can do. So it can photoelectrically absorb, Compton scatter, or it can transmit or pass through unaffected, meaning that photon just blows right through the part and there's no loss in energy, there's no change in direction, it continues right through the part directly to the image receptor. Um, typically, your absorption and your transmission is what creates your image that represents the anatomy it's passed through. Remember, scatter does an image anatomy, so only your transmission and your absorption actually create the image. And if, if the scattered photons strike your IR, it compromises quality, meaning it obscures the anatomy, it adds unwanted shades of gray to your image, which takes away from the quality of the image. Okay, so transmission, again, notice there's no change in wavelength, there's no change in frequency, and that photon is coming straight through the patient, directly interacting with the image receptor, and that is a transmitted photon. And we do require some of those, otherwise we would have no, no dark shades on our image. Now, what affects the beam attenuation? One of the factors that affects beam attenuation is the tissue thickness, okay? And when we talk about the tissue thickness, for a given, um, for given anatomy, when you increase the thickness, you increase the beam attenuation either by absorption or by scattering, okay? So when you, when you actually have a thicker part, there's more chance of it interacting within that part than if you have a thinner part. Okay, so when you increase thickness, you increase attenuation. If you decrease the thickness, you decrease the attenuation. Also, the type of tissue, I'm sorry, that was, that was the second picture. That is actually on page 87 that goes along with the tissue thickness, showing you um, the amount of photons that get attenuated as it passes through. Not only does tissue thickness, the type of tissue actually um, affects beam attenuation as well. So when tissue is made up of a higher atomic number, like bone, which is made of calcium, which is atomic number 20, that will attenuate the x-ray beam more so than tissue with a lower atomic number, like fat. Now, this isn't in the book, but when they said a lower atomic number like fat, I, I thought, well, fat doesn't have an atomic number. But truly, fat is actually made up of, um, fat is considered a glyceride, so it's made up of oxygen and hydrogen. So when you think about that, oxygen is number eight, hydrogen is number one, so very low atomic number elements compared to bone, which has a higher atomic number, 20, barium, 56, iodine, 53. So what you're passing through, not only what the tissue is composed of, but if there's any contrast media in that tissue, that would affect attenuation as well. The tissue density also plays a factor, like how dense is the tissue. Um, if a particle is more dense or compact, it will attenuate the x-ray beam more. Think of something like muscle. Muscle is very dense and compact. Um, bone, muscle, fat, and air make up most of the beam attenuation in the human body. So if we go to from most radiopaque would be bone, then muscle, then fat, and air would be the most radiolucent, okay? Another way you can think of tissue density um, doesn't necessarily have to be with regard to thickness, um, but the denseness. Like if you think about angel food cake, angel food cake is very thick, but it's very light and airy, right? It almost is like a little sponge. But then if you think about cheesecake, like a real New York cheesecake, tends to be very thin, but very, very dense, very heavy. So don't think in in terms of thickness when you think of density it's how how compact and cheesecake is very very dense compared to angel food cake or sponge cake something like that 
All right. Um, also, x-ray beam quality affects attenuation. When you have higher penetrating x-rays, meaning the shorter wavelength, higher frequency, more energy, those are more likely to be transmitted through the tissue without interacting with any of the tissue's atomic structure. Whereas lower penetrating or lower energy x-rays, when they have a longer wavelength, less frequency, they're more likely to interact with the atomic structure and potentially be absorbed. Okay, so high KVP, you tend to have more transmission, more Compton scatter, less photoelectric absorption. Low KVP, you tend to have more photoelectric absorption, less transmission, less Compton scatter. All right, this next picture um, is actually on the bottom of page 88, and this is showing you how the energy of the beam actually affects how it interacts with the tissue. Okay, so what we just said, um, this is exhibiting that this has lower energy, longer wavelength, less frequency. So most of those X-ray photons got absorbed and you have a little bit of exit radiation. Whereas when they're higher energy, shorter wavelength, more frequency, you have a lot more photons exiting the patient, a lot more remnant or exit radiation. When we look at um, the tissue thickness, the tissue's atomic number, the tissue density, and the x-ray beam quality, it tells you how it affects attenuation as a whole, and then how it affects um, the absorption and the transmission. So just a nice, conc um, concise little chart that describes each factor and how it actually affects the absorption and the transmission that takes place in the patient. All right, when we look at this imaging effect, notice that they talk about the exit or remnant radiation is made up of transmitted photons and scattered photons, okay? Because absorbed photons don't exit the patient. They get absorbed in the patient. So your remnant radiation is made up of transmission and Compton matter. And when we talk about fog, or more specifically, radiation fog, that is unwanted exposure on your image caused by Compton scattered radiation, okay? So when this scatter is coming out of the patient over here, notice it's missing the image receptor, which is right here, this short black line, this is the table. So this scatter, it's not great, we eliminate it completely, but this scatter is not going to affect our image receptor, which is a good thing. But if it were to strike the image receptor, remember, it's not going to image anatomy. It's not going to give, you, give us any useful information. It's only going to take away from the quality of our image by adding unnecessary, unwanted shades of gray. Also, when we look at the imaging effect, the shades of gray or the brightness that's recorded in the radiographic image is what makes your tissue visible, okay? Because you have absorption in the spine, right? It's photoelectrically absorbed in the spine, then it's brighter. So there's an increase in brightness. And where you have the soft tissue of the abdomen, the peritoneal cavity, um, the organs, the small and large intestines, the liver, the spleen, where you don't have as dense of an object, you tend to have more shades of gray. And it's that difference between the brightnesses and the shades of gray that give you your contrast and allow things to become visible. We can see the pelvis because of the differences in the shades or the differences in the brightness levels that are recorded in our image. We can see air in the intestines because it stands out from the rest of the tissue around it. Okay, that is our contrast that we're looking at. When they talk about the image receptors or the IRs, they tell you that with the latent image, again, the latent image is the invisible image that exists on the exposed film or on the exposed IR before it gets processed. 
Okay, so it's the invisible image after exposure, but prior to processing. You could have that on film, but you also have a latent image on your CR images and your DR images, though the time factor might not be that long. A manifest image is the actual visible image on the exposed film after it's been processed. So the manifest is the tangible visible image. Like if we were looking at this picture back here, this is a manifest image, meaning it's our final image. It's something that we can see and it's actually tangible. And they reference that as far as IRs go, digital imaging is the most common method in radiography now that creates the radiographic image. So we tend to have all, most all of the imaging you will see is going to be digital. Film is pretty much gone. Even CR um, is, is less prominent than DR, direct radiography imaging. So digital imaging, things that are done on the image receptors and you view the images on a monitor, that is the most popular form of image receptors out there currently. When we talk about digital imaging and acquiring the latent image, there are all kinds of types of digital detectors that record that remnant radiation. Okay, so we use a specialized image receptor that acquires or captures that latent image, and then the computer processes the manifest or visible image for display on a monitor. Okay, so what happens is you have a digital detector that captures the remnant radiation. A computer then takes those exit x-ray intensities and converts them to digital data, meaning each value is assigned a specific shade of gray that correlates to what we visually see on our manifest image. And all digital images are displayed on a computer monitor which gives us the capability of altering our image. I have talked before about the fact that you can post process an image, meaning in, a, in, a, in lay terms, you can edit that picture to make it look better or look differently after you've taken it, which is a really cool concept, but you have to be careful because sometimes you can alter the image so much that the radiologist can't get back to the original image. Since we are not radiologists, there is the potential for us to obscure anatomy or cause the radiologist to miss information just because of are manipulating um, that image. So we have to be very careful when we do that. All right. Hang on one second. And realize that that monitor that displays that image has to be a very high quality monitor because realistically you could have all the bells and whistles on your equipment and if your monitor is very poor quality then you've wasted all that money on your equipment whereas you might have equipment that isn't you know necessarily the the, the highest dollar but if you have a really high dollar monitor then that that's better actually so realize that the monitor um, is a huge issue if you ever get the opportunity to go look at a radiologist reading area and look at the monitors they have and the the resolution that they have on those monitors it is unbelievable compared to tech monitors are really really good but they're not near the quality of the radiologist but think about it he or she is putting his license on the line every single time they read an image that we take. So it would make sense that they would have to have top-notch equipment. So when they're making those diagnoses on the patient, um, that they, they have the best equipment available to them. Ideally, we take the best possible pictures for them so that when they read those images, they're accurate so that the patient gets the best possible treatment.
All right, the digital detector can respond to a very wide range of x-ray exposures. It's said to have a wide dynamic range, meaning that those receptors can respond to thousands of, they not only respond to, it can display, respond to display thousands of shades of gray in that patient. Film was very limited. So digital images have a very wide dynamic range, okay? And um, when they talk about that dynamic range, um, they talk about if you have an area that has widely different attenuation factors, you're, it's more easy to visualize that on a digital receptor, okay? Um, when we talk about the dynamic range of that, how it has a wider dynamic range, Basically, that is the imaging systems, um, the range of exposures that the imaging system is capable of detecting. Okay, so it can detect a wider range of these in the patient. So when you have anatomy that has hugely different attenuation factors, like the abdomen and the chest, right? Um, the chest more so, you have bone in there, you have soft tissue, you have muscle, you have fat, um, you have all different kinds of attenuation factors in there, but you can make out each of those because the digital receptors have such a great um, dynamic range and they have the capability of capturing all that. Another thing about digital receptors is that if it's slight under or overexposed, typically those images will come out looking acceptable. Why? Because the computer has programming that allows it to display appropriate brightness levels and appropriate contrast levels, even though your exposure may have, might have been too excessive or slightly inefficient. All right, now why can it do that? Because the digital images are made up of numeric data that can be manipulated by the computer system. It's simply a matter of programming. So when it captures all these different um, anatomy, all this different anatomy that has different um, attenuation factors, the digital system is capable of detecting more of them and also capable of taking an under or overexposed image within reason and making it appear acceptable. But I've told you guys before that that to me is kind of a pet peeve because what it does is give the technologist a slightly false sense of security and competency, meaning you might consistently overexpose your IRs. And if you're not paying attention to the um, the factors that show us that and not doing something about it, and you might always be over radiating every single patient you have, but you believe that your images are good because they look acceptable, okay? So they might look acceptable, but what I'm telling you is even though they look acceptable, they might not truly be acceptable. <clears throat> The digital image is actually composed of a matrix, which is made up of pixels. And this is actually on page B. The matrix is, um, just to, to simply put it, it's basically columns and rows of little square picture elements, okay? It's rows and columns of small square picture elements, and those square picture elements are called pixels. Now that picture on page 90 is absolutely not to scale, um, absolutely not. It's just showing you how when you take this matrix and you have little square picture elements, each little square, each little pixel is responsible for capturing just that amount of information, nothing more, okay? So each pixel, represents an area in the body, okay? Each little pixel correlates to a specific anatomic area in the patient. So that pixel is responsible for all the information inside itself. And then those pixels make up the matrix, which are rows and columns 
of pixels. Now, when we look at this, um, these three images happen to be on the top of page 91, and they tell you that you get better quality images when you have a larger matrix that has a greater number of pixels. Because what happens is if you make the matrix size larger, your pixels actually get smaller, which means it's responsible for less information, which means it has the capability to record that information more accurately, giving you better resolution. Okay, so they tell you that for a given field of view, the larger the matrix, the greater the number of pixels in that matrix, and not only more of them, but they're smaller. So like in picture A, the matrix size is 64 by 64. Picture B, the matrix size is 215 by 215. And picture C, the matrix size is 2048 by 2048. And if you look on here or in the book, picture C is much better. It has the best resolution out of all three. Picture A has the worst resolution. Why? Because the pixels are larger and they capture more information, but the resolution is poor on picture A. The resolution on picture C is excellent. All right. The numeric value that gets assigned to each pixel is determined by the attenuation of the x-rays. Okay, meaning that when you have a pixel that is going through something very radiolucent, it's going to come up darker, meaning there's higher density or higher exposure to the IR in the areas where it's dark. More likely transmission took place. Where you have pixel values that have very low density or low exposure, meaning the areas where there's bone, um, where it's radiopaque, there's not going to be much exposure because most of what has happened in that area is photoelectric absorption. So do you see where it's a combination of transmission and absorption that actually gives you a matrix made up of pixels with different numeric values that allow your anatomy to be accurately represented on the image receptor. And they tell you, I'm not going to get heavy into this, but each pixel has a bit depth, and that controls the exact pixel brightness that can be specified. All right? So the bit depth actually determines the, um, the gray level that can actually be demonstrated. And the last thing they talk about is the um, fluoroscopy. Remember that fluoroscopy is imaging in motion. It's dynamic imaging. Okay. So when we take our x-rays, our still pictures, that is considered static imaging. And when you're watching something in motion, like you're watching a patient swallow barium, or you're watching... Um, the contrast media move through the large intestine on a barium enema. When you fluoro something, it's live, it's in motion. So it's considered dynamic imaging. So dynamic imaging is where you create images of a moving internal structure, and typically it is viewed on a display monitor. When they do reference that when you add contrast media, it improves the visualization of the internal structures because, because a lot of our internal structures are hollow organs. It is very difficult to see all of those organs on an image. Let's go back to this one for a second. If we look at this picture of the abdomen, we know that this patient likely has uh, 25 feet of small intestine, about 5 feet of large intestine, but can we see the bulk of that? No. Why? Because it's a hollow organ. So we can see where there's some air in the intestines. That's visible to 
But as far as visualizing the small and large intestine, the only way we would be able to do that is by having the patient ingest barium or iodine, because then you would fill that hollow organ with a contrast media that would allow photoelectric absorption to take place, and you could actually visualize the anatomy where the contrast media is. So when we do fluoroscopy, contrast media definitely plays a part in allowing us to visualize. This is trying to show you the patient swallowed barium, and I believe they're showing you right there that that is the esophagus full of barium. All right. Um, and when they talk about image intensification, the image intensifier is basically, um, the image intensifier made the fluoroscopic image brighter, up to 600 times brighter than it would be without the image intensifier. And the image intensifier is actually found, if you look on page, there's a picture of the image intensifier. Hold that thought. Well. Of course, I'm not going to find it now because I want to find it now. Image intensifier is on page. Okay. The image intensifier, no, nope, that's not that. It is on page 220. Actually, there's a better picture on 218. Okay, figure 15 point. That is an image intensifier. And that is used in fluoroscopy. And what it does is it allows the image to appear up to 600 times brighter than it would without the image intensifier. But what they're, what they're telling you now is that it's pretty much being replaced with flat panel detectors in fluoroscopy. So the flat panel detector is uh, kind of like the, the newest equipment out there. And a lot of uh, facilities are replacing their image intensified fluoroscopy units with the flat panel detectors. Okay. All right. So that concludes chapter eight, image production. I don't really have a visual video to go along with this because I think it just is a a compilation of all the things we've talked about so far, as far as um, from chapter seven, the photoelectric absorption interaction, the Compton scatter, and then adding in transmission and stating that what you're passing through plays a part as far as how it, it displays on your digital receptor and giving you some of the components of like the matrix and the pixels um, and I will tell you that when we go back to this picture of the, um, the pixels, that would work, um, this picture. Now, when you're looking at it like this, does it make sense that you're looking at it in two dimensions, right? There's no depth to that. But when you look at it, like when they pull it out, do you see how there's depth to this pixel? So when there's depth to it, it's actually called a voxel because it represents each pixel represents a volume of tissue. So it's truly called a voxel, okay, because it has depth to it. But when you're just looking at the square picture element like this, it's only two-dimensional, but we're imaging three-dimensional objects, All right? So again, when you have a matrix, the larger the matrix, the smaller the pixels, and there are more of those pixels. And they tell you, one other thing I didn't mention is that when you have a matrix size, like when we looked at this image and I said the matrix size for A 
was um, 65 by 65 or 64 by 64, you can calculate the number of pixels in a matrix literally by multiplying that out. So if picture A has 64 by 64, there are 4,096 pixels in this matrix. Okay, so 4,096 in that, but picture C has 1,020, or I'm sorry, 2,048 by 2,048. So picture C has 41 million, 940, nope, I take that back. 4,194,304 pixels compared to 4,000 something. So it kind of stands to reason with that many more pixels and that much smaller of a pixel, the resolution is much better in picture C. So to calculate the number of pixels in a matrix, you simply multiply the matrix side. Size. So if it's 2048 by 2048, you take 2048 times 2048, and you get 4194304. That's how many pixels would be in that matrix. So the larger the matrix, the more pixels, and the pixels are smaller, which gives you better spatial resolution. All right, if you guys have any questions or comments or concerns, go ahead and write those down, and we will make sure to address them the next time we meet. Thank you so much.